lot of changes happening in the world of higher education, which quite obviously impact educational technology and where it's appropriate. We had the opportunity to talk to Scott Jassick and Doug Letterman, co-editors of Inside Higher Ed. And in this discussion, we were able to cover um, online education and distance education. It's not new. It's happened for decades. We're able to talk about recent developments with massive open online courses, or MOOCs, and how those change the conversation. We talked about how the traditional classroom is also getting affected by technology. And then finally, we also talked about what are the issues that get raised by the usage of technology. So Michael, from listening to this, what did you hear? What struck you? Well, what I heard was that there are a lot of conversations on campuses that need to be happening about these changes that aren't yet happening. There are questions about uh, goals, uh, access, affordability, uh, cost, quality. There are questions about um, resource challenges and labor issues. And because these uh, new changes are coming up in conversation based on hype and campuses are in a reactive mode, we're not seeing the kind of discussion that needs to happen in order for institutions to decide how they can move forward together to solve real educational problems. We're hoping to catalyze some of those conversations here. So with that, let's go to Phil's conversation with Scott and Doug. We're here with Scott Jassick and Doug Letterman. They're both co-editors of Inside Higher Ed, which is a publication that covers as a news source for all of higher education. So I think it's a great opportunity to talk to you guys today, and thank you for coming. Thank Our, you. My pleasure. To get started, online education in particular, and even distance education, there's nothing new right there. This has been going on for a while. So how do we get to the point that we're at with inside higher education, and why should schools care about this? You mean with, di with distance education? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it, uh, we, we've had distance education for a long time. So after World War II, the GIs stay in Germany, and then later in, in Korea. And institutions like University of Maryland, University College, created correspondence programs supplemented by people being over there. You have places like City University of New York for decades has been doing CUNY TV, offering courses on television. Mm -hmm. So all kinds of long-standing experiments and actual programs without people being physically on campus. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 90s and then taking off uh, in 2000 and on, you had colleges using online education to offer courses, some for credit, some not, to students all over. You had, and what's different sort of starting in the 90s and now, we're in different periods of this, uh, we had a bunch of entrepreneurial institutions, uh, for-profits like the University of Phoenix, uh, and also very entrepreneurial uh, traditional colleges like say Regis College or St. Leo's that created programs and were educating many more students off campus than on campus. And the public sector, places like Penn State, places like University of Maryland, University College, educating many more students online than in person. So this has been going on for a long time. Um, what we're seeing now is a different stage. The original players, generally not the elite institutions, now with MOOCs, you have a different set of institutions saying, we want to uh, be part of this market and to define the market. Sure. What I see is I see the, the desire to use technology mostly because of the financial pressures that institutions are under and that states are under, desire to use technology to try to bend the cost curve. There's a sense that um, we that the number there's a great desire to increase the number of people with college credentials of some sort. President Obama and a slew of foundations and others are trying to push this completion agenda, as we call it, um, and there's a sense that technology can be part of the answer in doing that because you can't educate a whole lot more people with flat or even decreasing funds. And so there's a sense that the technology makes possible certain kinds of education that wasn't possible before. Well, let's actually jump a little bit more into the MOOC subject because as we're saying, MOOCs did not begin online education. Even today, they're only one of the models that are out there. But it's important, particularly in terms of what's uh, being viewed by the public and some of the key stakeholders. Why have MOOCs brought new schools into the discussion about online education? And why should campus leaders actually care about MOOCs and what they might be able to do? Let's say you're a public university. For most public universities right now, they have classes that are larger than they would like. Yeah. And many of them have waiting lists to get into class. 
So theoretically, you could use MOOCs if, they, if you're happy with the quality of instruction combined with some sort of on-campus instruction to teach a lot of people you don't have room for or instructors to teach. There's also a lot of excitement about the uh, concept of the flipped classroom, sure. where lectures are replaced by online content delivery and you're using the classroom time in different ways. But a lot of this, you have to look at the details. If the motivation is just to save money and do it in the least expensive way possible, well, then you just broadcast MOOCs. Yeah. Uh, and then there are real questions about the student experience. Doing distance ed well, generally, and this is pre-MOOC and post-MOOC, good distance education isn't cheap. Because in good distance education, there actually may well be student-faculty interaction, student discussion, somebody actually grading papers. None of those things have to go away in online education, but if you have a MOOC teaching 200,000 students, they may go away. Sure. If you notice, the elite institutions are offering the courses, but they're not making really any movement at all toward offering credit for those courses on their sure. own campuses. Those institutions say that they're using the MOOCs or that they're experimenting with MOOCs to try to inform, to understand how technology can, can enhance the classroom experience. And part of the reason there's some resentment against the elites because if you're a faculty member out at one of those mid-level publics, you're, you're a little worried that your administrators are going to tell you, or are going to replace you, honestly, with the MOOCs, uh, yeah. with, with online courses. And so there's real different motivations for, for why the institutions are getting into it in terms of the offering of the, the MOOCs, but also there's, there are real questions about how institutions are going to use them. So let's talk a little bit about um, the traditional classroom and how it's getting affected. What's driving the increased usage of educational technology in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom? Well, you have drivers from students and from faculty. From students, you have the reality that they're walking into class with multiple devices and are going to use them in various ways. Uh, whether they're opening their laptop and following course materials or on Facebook is a subject of much debate. But the fact is, they are online all the time. So the question is how to use that productively. On the educational side, you know, basic tasks like attendance, grading, communication with students, all online because that's the only way you would reach them. Uh, you can't call them on their landline. But, but more important, I think, is the use of technology, say, for early warning systems. Very, you know, people can tell which students are doing the work, which students are turning in assignments, how they're doing on certain topics. And so a professor can know uh, Phil is really you know, missing this concept or not doing his work and can reach out. With adaptive learning, individual exercises can point from, from task to task which subjects a student has mastered, which subjects a student hasn't. So it really is transforming uh, the educational experience in institutions with in-person students and faculty. And obviously technology is not the only way to deal with the economic challenges you're talking about, serving more students with reduced budgets. Um, we've seen very large class sizes just happening on their own. Does educational technology play a role there sort of after the fact of enabling or taking these large lectures and making them either more practical or more effective, or how do they well, affect that? Well, I mean, that's the thing. You certainly see things like the use of clickers, and I mean, that's the thing. When, if you define technology broadly, there are lots of ways that technology can can use, can can sort of shape the classroom and make it work better. I mean, the, 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 I was just at a meeting where somebody made the old joke about how distance education starts in the fourth row sure. of the classroom. So, so there are ways that technology can improve the the face-to-face -face classroom. There are other ways where um, it can be an alternative to it, but I think we're seeing a lot of interest in trying to see how technology can improve the outcomes and the performance of students in the classroom. At the same time, um, people, the need for people hasn't gone away. And one of the interesting phenomenon that we've written about and that we found out in our, in our surveys of campus leaders is that a lot of campuses say they are doing tons of surveys using technology to monitor what students are learning, uh, which courses they take, which patterns are working, and so forth. Then you ask them, are you confident you're using that information in a good way? Mm -hmm. They don't have very much confidence in that. And um, th that's not a slam on the technology. The technology is actually, in many cases, providing information that either a provost, an academic advisor, or an individual faculty member can use to help students. But 
if you don't train those people on how to use the information and give them the support and time to use that information, uh, you may be compiling data points to nowhere. You, you ultimately need somebody to act on technology. And for instance, a lot of the tools involving students, particularly at-risk students, um, they need academic advising from a person. Technology can greatly increase the information available, and there's a lot of evidence that it could lead to much better academic advising. But at the same time we've seen this technology take off, we've seen a gutting of academic advising because of budget cuts at institutions that serve low-income students. So it's not an either-or, uh, but a both. And, and that's um, why I think sometimes people miss the point about what's really going on with technology and learning. Are we actually seeing new models of education by applying technology to a face-to-face -face classroom that might impact the quality of what's, you know, of the student experience? And I'm thinking, for example, in a lot of the discussion around flipped classrooms or hybrid education. So if you have students looking at lectures or other digital material on their own time and then coming into classroom and discussing it and, and having the, co the instructor be the explainer, be the guide, sure. talk, work with the students who aren't getting it. That's where you have the potential for real, where, for technology to be the biggest advantage in my eyes. And, sure. and, and so the thing is, that will not happen if a governor announces, we're gonna use MOOCs to educate 20% more students without a penny more. Yeah. The minute when they make those decisions, what Doug just talked about won't happen. Now the flip side is, we just wrote about a group of women's studies professors who looked at the MOOC model and didn't like it. So they created what sort of an anti-MOOC, where but actually embraces a lot of MOOC teaching. Sure. They've got centralized videos that will be seen from students at 20 different campuses. But then at each campus, a real live professor in a classroom with 20 or fewer students will be leading discussions, doing individual exercises. Now there'll also be group discussion forums, so the students will be interacting with students who aren't on their campus, but ultimately the students will be graded as part of accredited colleges. Now, so this model uh, uses MOOC technology changes the teaching experience, broadens these classes to involve students from all over the world, actually, but um, isn't going to save anyone any money sure. because they're paying tuition at the colleges they're enrolled at. Now, there's probably, there are probably are no doubt ways to save money and improve the educational experience. Uh, where we see a lot of the problems, I think, are just when people automatically assume certain savings are possible at the same time you expect professors to do more. Higher ed will be a lot better off if technology spreads through experimentation uh, by the willing. I mean, the elite institutions have been able to build coalitions of the willing, uh, whereas institutions that are feeling more financial pressure have imposed technological solutions on their faculty members, promising great things and not necessarily delivering. And, and, if, and if this is allowed to spread, by those who believe in it. And, and, and I guess because the other thing our survey shows is that as faculty members get exposure to online learning, to technology, they become more supportive of it. Duh. Yeah. And, but, that's, but that takes time. And we're seeing that kind of experimentation. I think higher ed's taken a little bit of a, of a knock for never experimenting. That's just not true. There's a lot of experimentation going on, but it isn't as fast as some policymakers and some foundations want it to be. So it sounds like a lot of the issues that get raised by the technological change don't just come from the technology per se or whatever the specific innovation, but even from the way it's implemented. If it's done without faculty buy-in or if it's just dropped in or if it leads to an assumption. But the So we have an opportunity to implement and it could exacerbate certain issues or we could implement it a different way that will actually address the underlying issues that we need to face. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. I'd like to thank Scott Jassick and Doug Letterman from Inside Higher Ed for a great discussion. But now we'd like to turn to you. On your campus or within your context, which are the educational challenges that are the most important and the most appropriate to be addressed with educational technology? And likewise, what are the areas where it's the most risky and the least appropriate to use technology to address on your campus? We'd like to hear from you in the discussions that we're creating.